नमस्कार वाह देखिए जयपुर की गर्मी बढ़ रही है तापमान बढ़ रहा है सेशंस का भी तापमान बढ़ना चाहिए साथ साथ एंड विद दैट वी वेलकम यू टू द फिफ्टींथ एडिशन ऑफ द जयपुर लिटरेचर फेस्टिवल प्रोटेक्टेड बाय डेट ऑल बनेगा स्वस्थ इंडिया ह्योर एट द फ्रंट लॉन we are delighted to introduce the republic of hindutva this session is presented by the week academic and author badri narayan's recent book republic of hindutva how the sangh is reshaping indian democracy follows the transforming identity of the rss in the heartlands of uttar pradesh writer politician and diplomat pavan k verma is the author of several popular and best selling books including his latest the great hindu civilization achievement neglect bias and the way forward badri narayan and pavan k verma have been following the evolution of the rss since it, since it was first established in 1925 in conversation with editor news 9 plus and author sandeep unnithan they examine the evolving nature political structure and the culture of the sangh while decoding the belief systems that form its core I will now, one by one, introduce our speakers on stage. May we please have on stage first, Mr. Badri Narayan, social historian and cultural anthropologist. He is the director of the G. B. Pant Social Science Institute, Prayagraj. Besides having written a number of articles, both in English and Hindi, he has recently authored *Republic of Hindutva*, and his other critically acclaimed books include *Fractured Tales*. invisibles in indian democracy the making of the dalit public in north india uttar pradesh from 1950 to present and women heroes in dalit assertion in north india among others we welcome you sir may we have on stage next mr pavan k verma a writer diplomat and politician who has authored over a dozen best selling books including ghalib the man the times the great indian middle class the book of krishna being indian becoming indian and chanakya's new manifesto he was conferred an honorary doctorate for his contribution to diplomacy literature culture and aesthetics by the university of indianapolis in 2005 verma is the recipient of the attakalata bengaluru literature festival prize the kalinga international literary award and the jukh tukse which is bhutan's highest civilian award Varma's latest book is The Great Hindu Civilization Achievement Neglect Bias and the Way Forward. We welcome you sir. May we have on stage next Sandeep Unnithan, editor News 9 Plus magazine in New Delhi where he writes on issues of national security. He is the author of Black Tornado, The Three Sieges of Mumbai 2611 and Operation X. The Bangla edition of the latter was released in Dhaka on November 8, 2021. in the run up to the 50th year anniversary celebrations of the 1971 war ladies and gentlemen sandeep unnisan this panel is decorated i am not therefore i will take your leave and hand you over to these three fine gentlemen thank you so much ladies and gentlemen thank you good afternoon ladies and gentlemen 48 hours ago the bharatiya janata party pulled off an astounding victory in uttar pradesh uh, it's the first political party to have come back to power in lucknow in over three decades and it's not an isolated case because the bjp has been winning elections in uttar pradesh which as you know is our most politically significant state in terms of numbers the bjp has won every election there from 2014 on 2014 2017 2019 and now 2022 there's a pattern to these victories these are not flashes in the pan it's part of a larger change in the narrative in the political narrative and i have with me two very distinguished speakers who've written two books on this subject who i'm going to be talking about today i have lots of questions to ask them my first question is to badri narayan ji as a journalist Badri ji, how did the results um, on the 10th of March surprise you? Because there seemed to be some kind of confusion a few months back whether the BJP would come back to power. How surprised were you with the results? No, it it didn't surprise me. It was 
written on the people uh, uh, heart of the people uh, wall of the people heart and we could read during the process of election that when election campaign that it is going to be happen and it happened so uh, if you want to explain me how it happened uh, i can say uh, i think there are three things which we observed during election uh, campaign uh, and and that ensured the bjp victory in this election first thing is quite quite polarization no it's a, every polarization has a counter polarization and this time samajwadi party voters were very vocal and the bjp voter were silenced but very silently they polarized and they consolidated themselves and they voted to the to the booths second thing is uh, every state created sort beneficiaries uh, but what bjp did they created a huge number of beneficiaries but transformed those beneficiaries in the consciousness community to consciousness not merely a physical body but consciousness by constantly following them modi ji appealed to the cadres go to the diwali ke din to the house of the pm awas yojana uh, beneficiaries and, and distribute the sweets have a sweets with them deep jalaiye aur unke sath mithai khaiye and and workers did that so constantly followed their beneficiaries and transformed them in a consciousness we call it beneficiary consciousness uh, and that's very interesting to know how it, how this consciousness worked thirdly modi has a state a still a very trust capital a strong trust capital rich trust capital among people he uh, constantly evolved in spite of all complaints all uh, failures which we we uh, talked about that the monetization mishandling of the corona whatever uh, unemployment berojgari but his trust value is still maintained among people so when he led the campaign earlier the election was yogi modi election for bjp but when he started campaigning it became modi yogi election modi yogi and versus akhilesh earlier akhilesh wanted to make it akhilesh versus yogi but bjp uh, modi turned this axis and made it modi yogi uh, versus akhilesh and fourth which is uh, not for any uh, which is not have any party hamare paas ma hai tumhare paas kya hai and that is rss because bjp has a rss uh, support of the rss which other party don't have uh, you know many there were lot of a lot of dissatisfaction among bjp workers and when rss took over this and they try to pacify those things and they also worked at the booth level uh, we what we observed during election came, uh, they, on the day of election at many booths bjp workers were just couldn't come no wo ghar pe baith gaye the but rss were cadres were there they handled the the war rooms they hand the district war rooms they handled the uh, booth very efficiently and they managed the election in their own they very silently no one was knowing that they are working and who are they and they were they were uh, helping bjp to win this election so and the four, last thing is the suraksha the notion of suraksha suraksha worked as a double double meaning metaphor in this election suraksha uh, and, uh, slogan was given by the yogi uh, yogi in his first meeting of the national uh, cons, uh, bjp national council he said that this election is going to be the election of the law and order suraksha and law and order worked in two way firstly suraksha kisse muslim mafia se mostly uh, it, it is it, it is not uh, obviously said but mafias bulldozer jinke khilaf chalega and who were uh, those mafias we all know uh, jinko target kiya secondly uh, suraksha against from dominant caste and that worked well so in this election bjp tried to create a class within caste class through beneficiary consciousness class through suraksha Uh, suraksha from the all, from the dominant fro- to the all against dominant that was the campaign mode of the campaign and this worked well in the selection pavan ji you've written in your book the great hindu civilization about the bjp and rss's interpretation of hinduism the fact that the hindutva that they espouse is very different from the hinduism that we know uh, that we've been following for centuries Can you tell us a little more about why you think this is the case and whether it's actually playing out on the ground in Uttar Pradesh? Thank you, point. thank you, Sandeep. First, quickly to respond to your first question, uh, I think the 
results of these elections were foregone. And the reason is that BJP had a face and a narrative. I don't say I agree with that narrative, but that narrative consisted of three parts, which they have used successively in elections. The first is political Hindutva, which seeks to divide voters on the basis of religion to maximize short-term political gain. The second was hyper-nationalism by which they proclaim a monopoly on what is nationally good for Indian citizens and considers all others who question it as being tantamount to anti-national. The third was welfareism on the ground, which has been built up, which is in terms of direct benefit trans transfer of money, of rations, of uh, Avas Yojana, Ujjavala, and so on and so forth. But there is a fourth reason not in the BGP side. The opposition was just not organized to take on this election. Uh, in the Uttar Pradesh, uh, a combination of 8% uh, Yadavs and some 16-17% Muslims don't add up to a constituency that is sufficiently wide based to defeat the social engineering of the BJP. The BJP had the forward castes, the Brahmins and the Thakurs, and the BJP had, which is 14% of the population, and the BJP had the non Yadav OBCs, which they have cultivated over a period of time, which constitute 32% of the constituent of the of the voters. And in addition, they had at least the non Jatav Dalit. So the social engineering was such that the BJP's win was inevitable, not only in UP, but also Uttarakhand. Uh, the fact that the opposition was not organized is something the opposition must introspect about. Because you, you have to compare what the opposition's ability to organize itself is with the non-stop planning and organization of the BJP. You may have noticed that after these elections, Prime Minister Modi was already in Gujarat. So, these are the things that the opposition needs to learn. You cannot say that the BJP has a walkover only because of Hindutva or because they polarize votes. We have found in our survey, sorry, I'm slightly digressing. I'll come to your question. That even in the moments of maximum polarization, post Godra, post Babri Masjid, post, during the West Bengal Assembly section, uh, elections recently, when the BJP transparently carried out a campaign entirely based almost on religious polarization. Our survey showed that even on these occasions, not more than 55% Hindus are affected and vote only as Hindus and at least 45% Hindus vote as secular citizens on issues other than that of religion. So these are factors why the BJP can still be defeated and is defeated in assembly elections, but at the national level, there is no alternative to it in terms of an organized opposition. Now to your question, pardon my uh, adding to what Badriji said. You see, there is no point in merely demonizing the ultra-right, which is largely fronted by the RSS. The RSS played a very constructive role, for instance, in the 1962 war against China, helping the government. The RSS played a role in 65, in 71. And uh, the RSS was in fact uh, invited by Jawaharlal Nehru to send a contingent to participate in the Republic Day Parade in 1963. Because of this social service they rendered at critical moments. But what has happened recently is that the BJP always was hyphenated with the RSS. 
in recent times we have seen that beyond the rss but with the blessings of the rss certain other forces have been unleashed on the ultra hindu right which in my view reflect the lowest common denominator of hinduism what are its features these cadres and i speak specifically of the creation of the bajrang dal what are its features first of all when they say that they are protectors of hinduism their knowledge of the intellectual grandeur and nuances of hinduism is almost nil if you take a bajrang dal worker lock him in a room and say we will release you only if you write half a page on the principal tenets of hinduism they can't do it secondly and because of this reason they are averse to dialogue they believe in their certitudes and consider anyone else questioning them to be against the interests of hindus themselves thirdly they are an extremely conservative group usually supportive of the social inequalities in society drawn largely from certain caste segments which are pro the 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 the, the inequalities within society fourthly they are extremely patriarchal there are many women in this audience you would be aware about their comments about what women should wear to be chaste hindu women what they should not wear what they should eat what they should drink who they should meet who they should marry and we have seen instances of this where chief ministers have commented on ladies wearing jeans and saying this is un hindu we have seen campaigns against ad agencies uh, where where they feel that they are not portraying women as chaste hindus we have seen uh people from the shriram sene barge into an adjunct of the bajrang dal rss parivar barge into bars and restaurants and saying women should not hindu women should not be here and so on so forth fourthly fifthly they you make the deliberate mistake of conflating religion with patriotism so if you are hindu you are naturally patriotic if you are not your patriotism is suspect seventhly they are effortlessly prone to violence and of a kind of new violence which does great damage to the essential tenets of hinduism chanting jai shri ram while you are lynching a person in public and in a mob they are more violent and lastly they believe that they have an inherent right especially in the in, in enabling political regime today of taking the law in their own hands so i say that what has happened now as a result of political changes is the empowerment of a new form of lumpen hinduism which is extremely dangerous to hinduism itself and we need to and the, what is the bjp's approach to it if they commit too much of an excess they say we are not involved this is not right but the tacit encouragement enables them every time to go a step further and they prove to be extremely useful and valuable foot soldiers on the electoral field and that i think is the new development of this republic of india badru ji uh, you want to respond to that is there is there a conscious attempt to bring in this kind of lumpen leadership or these lumpen elements within the right or is it just a case of what you mentioned in republic of hindutva there is a basmasur element that's somehow arisen and it's makes the uh, bjp leadership a little uncomfortable what what is the truth really actually uh, what we observe and i have written in my book also republic of hindutva that uh, after 90s we observe a new rss many people disagree with this concept what is new rss and they uh, so new rss in a way that this rss has to be very inclusive and they have to include everyone and that's their uh, ideals and this this ideal they are propagating but question comes even then why this kind of lynching and these things happen so uh, what we observed during field when i was writing that book 
that if you see the most of the cases of this kind of uh, event, I call uh, a fringe element of the Hindutva. Those who are not mainstream RSS people, sometimes they went to the Sakha, they have uh, formed their organizations and they have to prove that power is there in their hand. Power is there, they need an MLA ticket. Rana Pratap, uh, sorry, uh, this organization and that organization, Hindu Mahasabha, or ke, mala, uh, with, with various kinds of prefix and suffix, they have formed various kinds of organizations, small, small organization in Western UP. In Eastern UP, you can find a lot of organizations. We have documented the name of those organizations, how they work. And they, like this uh, hijab thing happened in, in, uh, in Bangalore, in, in Karnataka. So these are the all fringe elements and they push this kind of agenda for their own benefit. But RSS is not able to, RSS is not comfortable with them, but they are not able to handle them. And that's why yes, I said that this is, they are the Bhasmashur. No, ye apne ko hi jala lenge. Or ko bhi jala sakte. And that's the big uh, dilemma which RSS is facing, how to control these elements who are using their arguments partly in their own ways, reframing it and going to the people and doing this kind of uh, happenings. Pavanji is shaking his head very violently to the so, left uh, and right. Badri, I sometimes really wonder if we are mesmerized by the fringe argument. Today you don't know what is the fringe and what is the mainstream. I give you an example. There was shooting of a TV series called Ashram going on in Bhopal. Bajrang Dal workers stormed the set, destroyed and vandalized it, beat up people. So you would say it's a fringe element. Then the Home Minister of Madhya Pradesh, who is a BJP minister in the cabinet, condones what they did. That they, you should not hurt religious sentiment. In some manner, he tried to put a saving grace to this kind of transparent lawless action. Or for instance, an ad was started where the use of Urdu words were used, like we say Diwali Mubarak. Now here you would say it's a fringe element who illiterate, they don't know that we say Happy Christmas, we say Diwali Mubarak, this is not about preserving Hinduism or its chastity. But it was spearheaded by a sitting member of parliament of the BJP on a nationwide basis. And that particular clothing brand had to change its ads as a result of intimidation. Now you don't know where the fringe stops and where the mainstream begins. And I think while I would like to give the benefit of doubt to the BJP that it's trying to control such elements, I would like to see evidence of it. Where is the evidence? Padriji, you want to take that? Huh, may, uh, just I want to, uh, to respond to what Pavanji is saying. It's true that there is a very difficult to differentiate between fringe and mainstream. And mainstream sometimes reflect in the fringe. So I said that they are using the same argument which RSS has produced sometime earlier and re reusing it in a new way for their own benefit. That's why I'm saying them a fringe element. Bajrang Dal uh, involvement in various cases, actually that's the problem with the RSS because they are all produced by the same argument. And now they are uh, walking in, in their own way. RSS is changing. RSS wants to change themselves. Uh, themself. Various kinds of new innovations, new arguments are they are emerging in the, within the organization. But there will take some time to reach to the grassroots of the RSS grassroots. No, this, if you see this fringe, fringe as a grassroots, RSS grassroots, Hindutva movement grassroots, it will take some time to reach. But they are trying hard in their own way. And uh, to like the, the issue of the so, so this kind of thing you can, achha, ministers, involvement of the ministers, these ministers are also have a very kind of liminal, liminal uh, ideological position on these issues. I am agree. But this is because of, if you have a child who is born in that they are born in that family, that's true. No one is going to deny. But now the parent is saying, no, 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 don't do this. And so controlling those things is a very difficult. And that's ideological, uh, ideological tussle, which is going on uh, in the RSS also. 
बाहर से तो आई कैन से कुछ ए, कुछ भी कह सकते हैं वेरी इजी टू टेक दैट पोजीशन कि भाई ये तो ऐसे हैं वैसे इट्स वेरी सिंपल बट इफ यू गो इन 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 टू अंडरस्टैंड द कॉम्प्लेक्स रियलिटी ऑफ द आरएसएस वर्किंग इन द फील्ड यू कैन फाइंड दिस काइंड ऑफ नुएंसेस सो आई जस्ट यू सी आई 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 टेक योर पॉइंट बद्री बट my worry is that when a chief minister of a sitting state although he tried to later explain it when there was a national outrage in an election says this is an election of 80% against 20% now he later tried to provide an explanation to it but it's it's immediate inference is very clear and i my real worry and i i, I am not uh, i already said that the rss has many redeeming features in its uh, original evolution uh, and as an organized and disciplined force but i want to say that this kind of uh, reduction of hinduism to its lowest common denominator is extremely extremely damaging to the conquering eclecticism of hinduism itself now here is a religion One of whose mahavakyas is ekam sat vipraha bahuda vadanti. The truth is one. Wise people call it by different names. This was said by our sages thousands of years ago, at a time when most tribes or clans said that only our truth is true. There must be a reason why this audacity of thought, which is also the reason behind the tensile strength of Hinduism survival. over 5000 years and more you have a mahavakya says ano bhadra kritavo yantu vishrita let good thoughts flow to me from all directions and these are defining aspects of the hinduism you and i know which is not a prescriptive faith the attempt to make it into a wahabi faith to talibanize it to run it on a prescriptive basis of this is what you should do and this is what you should not do and we will decide what you should do and what you should not do here is a religion which says udhar charitanam vasudev kutumbakam for the big hearted the entire world is our family this was not said yesterday it was said millennia ago so i am trying to say to you that in hinduism there is a certain character and a strength i am not saying it's a passive faith hindus can fight for their rights and there are reasons why they should and i am willing to discuss those reasons why there was perhaps an understandable backlash among hindus for a variety of causes starting even from before 1947 but to convert to because of that backlash to transform it into this form of practiced hinduism and the anointment of these kind of thekedars to protect it is extremely dangerous for the nuanced intellectual sophisticated grandeur of hinduism padri ji before you respond i have one question to add to that um, you know in your book you mention the fact that you're looking at a very different uh, kind of politics that is unfolding and that's the reason you call it the republic of hindutva the fact is that the rss was always a social organization it was involved in social work and the upliftment of society whereas the bjp was the political wing but in the last 8 years or so we are seeing a very different kind of model that's emerging where the two parent and child are working closer together uh, to you know evolve a new kind of political model you see that uh, playing out now in uh, 2024 and in the elections preceding that yes uh, first of all i would like to with all respect to pawan ji uh we, there are a lot of confusions no uh, when we are talking about bjp i am talking about rss no rss and bjp is a, as a, a different kind of uh, ways to do politics and then the hindu and hindutva so there are four things are mixed but when we deal rss we should deal bit differently and uh, yes it has a relation with the politics i'll i'll tell you about that also the so first of all thing first of all rss works Uh, as a social cultural agenda to expand hindutva or to remake or reframe hindutva that's very clear and through that process they in, uh, their method is to earlier their method was their method may be the creating other the others now othering uh, mobilizational othering or mobilizing making others and then the uh, uh, create counter mobilization 
but when they came in the power means bjp came in the power 2014 and sang got a big uh, space to work then their polit their mobilizational politics not politics mobilizational strategy you can say change and that is including everyone even even they have to is a big uh, big churning in the rss how to deal with the muslims how to include them so your question is then yogi adityanath is why to, uh, saying that this is war between 80 and 20 and why uh, garmi utarna or this kind of thing came so that's the domain of the politics and uh, and that's this is the political posturing and here uh, there, there is a very blurred uh, uh, kind of a space between hindutva and the politics of hindutva and the hindutva as a social project but hindutva as a social project uh, which rss proposed create a canvas on which bjp politics grown and that's kind of relationship you can see from the very beginning and bjp you know you know bjp has a pavan ji know better than me bjp may ek sangathan mantri hota hai wo comes that person come from the rss and they become they are they, they, they are very powerful in in dealing very various things there is a kind of parivar no the hindutva parivar sangh parivar so bjp is a party of sangh parivar but within eight years as sandeep asked this question Uh, the relation is being closer and closer closer pehle bhi tha but that was on the grassroots which you couldn't see but uh, now this is uh, because of the researcher and the media they are bringing this news that rss workers are working for the elections rss workers are working on the booth so now this relation is being clear day by day but this relation was uh, always with them but i would also like to say that you should uh, you should pick the considerate that rss is working on various social issues better than many others of the oppositions and uh, corona time you see before that so many social projects and you know more than 150 organizations uh, social organizations they have formed they are allied uh, rss is paired organization they say ki isko sangh ka sangathan mat kahiye they are rss inspired sangathan more than पता नहीं कितने हम जानते भी नहीं है सरस्वती शिशु मंदिर यू ऑल नो बट यू मस्ट बी नॉट नोइंग कि आपके शहर में कितने और भी उस तरह के स्कूल्स चल रहे हैं दो आर पार्ट ऑफ द आरएसएस परिवार एंड आइडियोलॉजी सो सो वी नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड हाउ दे आर ग्रोइंग नहीं तो इफ यू नॉट अंडरस्टैंड एंड इफ यू सी द थिंग्स फ्रॉम द आउटसाइड यू विल ऑलवेज डू मिस्टेक एंड ऑलवेज यू विल गेट द रिजल्ट द वे यू हैव सीन इन दिस इलेक्शन and and that is uh, a bjp credit goes to the bjp uh, uh, credit goes to to the modi because modi is a very good communicator connect the people but the canvas the ground is prepared by the rss and and uh, uh, but with different names with different campaigns uh, so i say that hindutva making of hindutva project is going on that was ruptured during corona time because of the there are a lot of changes took place in corona because interaction is the basis of the rss politics and mobilizational strategy or corona ne interaction hi khatam kar diya so hindutva project stopped that time but they even even in those days through their social projects they uh, they uh, prepared their space to work for them to extend this hindutva project making of hindutva and that's the big project and hindutva mein sabhi ko they have uh, i just say rss has no foundation and no fundamentals uh, it has foundations and uh, so they are able to change themselves any time kabhi kuch aa jayega they can change their extent apne uh, ko they are they are always ready to redefine themselves to include others include others in my language you can say ki appropriate karne ke liye i have used this term appropriate term in my book so this is the politics maybe the strategic politics of the uh, appropriation uh, but isko other dusri bhasha mein इंक्लूजन भी कह सकते हैं आप इट्स अप टू यू आप चाहे जैसे देखें पिक्चर इज द सेम आप चाहे इधर से देख लें चाहे उधर से देख लें बट बेसिक माय बेसिक रिक्वेस्ट टू ऑल ऑफ अस दैट डोंट सी आरएसएस फ्रॉम द मीडिया न्यूज डोंट सी द आरएसएस फ्रॉम आवर ओपिनियन आर्टिकल्स यू सी आर एट द ग्राउंड द वे दे आर वर्किंग एंड वॉट काइंड ऑफ डिस्कोर्सेज आर गोइंग ऑन विद इन देयर विद इन सर्किल ऑफ द विद इन the hindutva community there i'll i'll read uh, pavan ji come in before we uh, uh, throw the floor open for questions pavan ji you want to respond no, to I, i think there is one i've had a lot of discussion with rss ideologues with the larger sang parivar 
recently I wrote uh, a book on Adi Shankaracharya. I wrote, wrote a book on Tulsi Das's Ramcharit Manas. I wrote a book on the great Hindu civilization. So the RSS generally feels that I am on the wrong side and I should be with them. And, so, and I am always willing for a Sabhya Samvad, a Shastra, a civilized discourse. My problem is that the beej of the entire ultra Hindu right movement, the centerpiece is a Hindu Rashtra. Now, you can go around it, but every step forward is in their assessment and incremental step towards that impractical, unfeasible, unsustainable goal to which they remain wedded. And I say, why? You must understand this. See, I'm not against a Hindu rush. If in this country, there were not people of so many other faiths in so many numbers and if the minority or the biggest minority was geographically secluded in one corner of the country bifurcated declare a Hindu Raj the problem is and this was articulated by Jawaharlal Nehru in his first letter to the chief ministers in 1948, where he said that our country has so many people of different faiths that there is no option in our own self-interest except for coexistence. Now, if 25% of Kerala has Muslims, roughly 30% of West Bengal has Muslims, if there are 40 million Muslims in UP, there are 20 million Muslims in Bihar. There are 14% in Karnataka, 12% in Tamil Nadu. I mean, if you look at this country, Hindus and Muslims live cheek by jowl in every Kasbah town, city and metropolis. Even the Christians who are 2% of the population, their numerical strength is more than the combined strength of Hungary and Greece. They live in this country. There are people of different faiths. Now, my worry is that if you carry this exclusive Hindu Rashtra agenda too far, we will have endemic religious instability, social strife, conditions almost simulating an um, completely avoidable civil war in every town, every district, it will send the economy into the tailspin. The whole country will be caught in a complete throes of instability. Therefore, in our own self-interest and in the interests of the majority community, there was a desire to create a nation which is sui generic in a way where there is a vision by which people of different faiths, both as a matter of ideology and practicality, live in harmony with each other. And so long as this goal does not change, which is the beej of the ultra-Hindu right, we are heading towards trouble. Pawanji, I'm just going to open the floor to questions. Uh, I see a lot of hands. Yes, ma'am. We unfortunately have time for just two questions. So this is a practical question. I am a Catholic, married to Hindu. I have lived as an Indian. In practical terms, how would the Hindu Rashtra change my rights as an Indian? Does it not allow me to vote in the same way, run for elections? How would it change the life of a Catholic or a Muslim living in India today? But uh, yeah. I'll, uh, the second question, please. Uh, the gentleman there in the center. Yes. Uh, don't you think that uh, this Hindutva brand of politics stands from the fact that uh, Hindus uh, have for ages felt insecure? Because uh, earlier, uh, this Pakistan and Bangladesh came into being. They were a part of uh, the grand India only. And uh, as per the estimates, that most of the population in the erstwhile Pakistan or uh, Bangladesh, they were mostly Hindus only, and they were all converted. And even in the uh, today's India also, so many conversions happened. 
and uh, the Muslims had been very forthright in demanding their rights, whether it is that 1985-86 uh, movement where they did not allow the alimony to be given to the uh, Muslim women, and they never want that, that there is should be any infringement on their uh, 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 the civil rights. So the Hindus have also for a very while, long time felt insecure. And secondly, there is another, I'm a common man and feel this notion that the other community gets united very easily. You know, we live as a Hindu, my brother may be thinking separately and based on that he would be going and voting. But then when we talk about Muslims, they, we always hear this from the media that 18, 19% together you. votes for one it. party I get, I get your question, sir, thank you. Uh, uh, first question, uh, I, I'll uh, like to respond second question, maybe uh, Pawanji will respond first question. Uh, you are very right that uh, this uh, politics of mobilization, I'm not saying about Hindu, Muslim, whatever, it build up on the insecurity, insecurity, insecurity create a worry and that worry creates a polarization, mobilization, consultation, whatever we can say. But uh, The intimate kind of enemy bhi hoti hai, worry bhi hota hai. To ek dusre ke khilaaf they can be mobilized. Counter polarization ka space bhot hota hai. So that same you can see in this contest. Ki uh, Hindu polarized after long time because of constant polarization of a certain community and and yeah, and evoked by the certain political parties. And and that is going to benefit the BJP. I'm not going to give a value judgment, but that's the political process which is going on. So that's thing you can observe even in the case of Pakistan, Bangladesh, this kind of argument you have given. I'm not going to that argument. I'm going basti to basti argument. And there are uh, element, but in the second phase, now they have come in power. Chaudhar say they are ruling this in India. Now they are, uh, this worry is being lesser. And they are being, they have, they are in a working on a project to include others now with not with the worry, but making themselves a strength in. So that's another process, which is, which has been started. So that's the, my question, uh, answer of your question. Haven't you want to answer uh, the lady's question? No, you, your question and insecurities can be on every side of the spectrum. See, if you read a literal reading of Veer Savarkar's uh, polemic on Hindutva. It says that only those for whom this land is both Pitrabhu and Divyabhu, that means the land of their ancestors or the land of worship, where their principal deity is of India, are entitled to full citizens and the rest are not even entitled to equal citizenship. Now, Veer Savarkar can be interpreted, he probably wrote this polemic which the BJP is frozen in time with. In 1923 or 24, uh, he wrote it, he was still in Ratnagiri jail, he was annoyed with the downplaying of the heinous Mopla riots, whether he meant it literally, because I can quote other passages of Savarkar which say that everyone in this country should live in harmony also. But somehow, Certain cadres of the ultra Hindu right have caught on to this, you know, primacy to the Hindus over all else. And that I'm afraid, and time will show, will lead to initially a separation from, next step, a demonization of, and a third step of perhaps differential rights. And this is something that we, you and I should understand. The question of the gentleman, if I take two minutes to comment. So you are right. There are insecurities in all communities and some of the angsts of the Hindu community are entirely understandable. And I believe they need to be rectified. Why did Mahatma Gandhi before 1947 support the Khilafat movement? It was a pan-Islamist movement. There was no need for Indians to support. There were people within the Congress, including Ambedkar, who opposed it, that created a backlash. Why did the Congress party, prior to independence, downplay the savage Mopla riots in which Hindus were killed? 
that created a backlash or perhaps the reason for the congress to do that was to preserve hindu muslim unity against a common enemy which was the british but that was important after 47 why did for instance jawarlal nehru only change the hindu personal law and left the personal law of other communities for the time being intact why did the congress party intervene in the shabano judgment to have it overruled by an ordinance merely to strengthen vote bank appeasement politics pavan ji we are out of time okay. so these are questions we take but i'm answer... saying don't allow, i'll just take 20 second you cannot you have to rectify these why are hindu temples not in the control of hindus themselves now these are questions we have to take on board rectify them but if we cannot allow the pendulum to swing to the other extreme where you create a situation of permanent and dangerous instability in our country on the basis of a religious divide i'm sorry we are completely out of time and uh, thank you very much i thank uh, my delegate uh, my uh, co speakers co panelists badri narayan ji and pavan verma ji for speaking at this very interesting session they are available to sign books after the event at the yellow tent at the rear uh, so you could bring your copies there thank you very much thank you pavan ji thank you badri ji on that note i would request mr raj mohan executive editor of the week to please come on the dais and present a token of remembrance to our guests on the stage mr raj mohan executive editor of the week Ladies and gentlemen, that was Badri Narayan and Pavan K. Verma in conversation with Sandeep Unnathan. What a fantastic session it is! And ideologies and ideas can be together. We also accept them to request this. Sir, we're not done with the gifts yet. There are more gifts coming your way. Uh, we also request them to accept a small token of our love and appreciation for. a fantastic and engaging session on on the agenda thank you so much ladies and gentlemen we also thank the week for their support in putting the session together uh, ladies and gentlemen don't go anywhere we'll be back at 1 o'clock with our next session which is titled it's a book launch it's called chrysalis so we'll be back with you shortly and as you also know jaipur music stage tickets available right there uh, you can go to the tent area there's tent 1 check out the festival bazaar there are some amazing local uh, regional uh, artisans and handic- uh, handicrafts workers coming there you could support them by making a purchase at the festival bazaar ladies and gentlemen uh, see you at 1 o'clock thank you so much <laughs>